all, all has its rhythm, and rock and roll has got its rhythm. But the Who has a kind of quirky rhythm, and that's why I say we were never a rock and roll band. We were always a rock band. Because it's, there's a kind of, it's on that, it's that slam. And it was Keith Moon that put that in. But, but we all had it, had it in us, but we hadn't found the key. And he was the key that ignited it. And that basically was the formation of the outer rhythm that is the who rhythm. That is, is totally different than any other new rock music that's out there. When those four people came together, four very, very different people in character, musical temperament, every single way, did you know that you had something special immediately, or did that only become apparent over time? We knew we had something special. We didn't know what it was because we were, in those days, to get work, you were expected to play whatever was in the top 20. And then if we played, a, we used to play an American servicemen's club, an officers club in Bayswater every Sunday, thanks to Betty Townsend, who was enormously important to our career in those days. You know, Pete's mum, Betty, absolute angel. She got us this gig at this American officers club in Bayswater called Douglas House. And it, we used to play it every Sunday afternoon. And of course, all these GI officers from all over America used to come up and they used to ask for Johnny Cash, you know, uh, uh, you know all these, uh, Chuck Berry, Jerry Lee, all these people that we, we barely heard of. And of course, we were expecting the next week play them what they requested the week before. So we had to go searching for this music. And they loved the fact that we were trying for them. We were, you know, we were not just going, this is what we do, we're not doing anything else. If they requested it, we'd try and do it. Um, so I knew we had something, but we didn't have it quite yet. And it was only when we started to get into playing the blues and and Tamla, Motown, and uh, uh, James Brown, and that kind of stuff, where it really started to, to become freer. Um, and Moon's drumming again had a lot to do with that. Moon, Moon's drumming and Pete's guitaring. Moon would double up the beat. We'd get bored of the 12 bar. So instead of doing that, ching, 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 he would double it up and go, and then it would become this cacophony of noise and Pete developed the feedback. And then, for some reason, we, did, but we kind of were telepathic. It was really weird. That we had an ability to kind of read the vibe of the music. And we could turn on a sixpence and we'd go from something like smokestack lightning into a, a kind of jazz-based thing. And it would be instant, all together, with no conductor, just everybody f feeling each other. It was extraordinary. It's a big leap, though, to go from that to Pete Townsend's original material. What did you think when he first started presenting material, and also, what was the kind of conversation about that? Um, it was quite obvious that we were going to need our own material. And Pete had written a couple of songs Previously, we'd done in a demo studio somewhere, and again down to Betty Townsend, we'd made this demo. I can't remember what it was called. Well, there's probably some aficionado in the audience who can shout it out. But we did a demo anyway, um, of two songs. Uh, and so it was obviously he, he could write. Um, but then we were, we were kind of um, mimicking other people. Um, we did, we did um, what was it, I'm the Face as the high numbers. Yeah. Which Keith, uh, sorry, Pete Meaden uh, plagiarised from uh, John Lee Hooker or someone like that. I can't remember. I mean, Pete Meaden, your manager at the time. Yeah, yeah. Pete Meaden was our manager yeah. and was the one that turned us load like, of yobs into mods. Yeah, I'd like to ask you about that. Well, it was only a little kid, nothing more. <laughs> Um, uh, and he, he plagiarised that song and wrote some lyrics to it that he thought were non-lyrics. I'm the face if you want it, mate. Um, 
I mean, it was quite obvious, obvious then that we were only ever going to be a covers band unless we could write our own songs. And then the kinks hit with their, you know, all day and all of the night. You know, you really got me and that kind of song. Those kind of songs. And, and Pete did it basically a kinks copy that I can't explain. But his lyrics, immediately, you went, you, you, you became aware that this was coming from somewhere a little bit different than most writers. Um, so that was the, f the first hit, and that got to number eight in the charts, and we were very pleased with that. Um, and then, of course, there was any way any how we were, which Pete, Pete had. He probably had three quarters of it written, but he didn't have the bridge. And we ran it down at the Marquee Club, because we were due to record a song, what song, we didn't even have it, the next day for the next single. That's how it was in those days. And I, I came up with the, with the, the Middle Eight, you know, nothing gets in my way. It's typical my attitude of life, <laughs> not even, even locked doors. That was my addition to it. So that was kind of a, a co-writing experience. And then there, there was the, the, the obviously you know, the substitutes and my generations, which were easy. Pete was obviously off on another trajectory that was, again, so different than anything else that was out there. Uh, then we got to the tricky part of our career for me, which is when he presented uh, Happy Jack. <laughs> Happy Jack, pictures of Lily. Pretty strange songs. Happy Jack. Well, the pictures of Lily I kind of loved. And that was, wasn't easy, because it was a story. It was great. Happy Jack, I find kind of weird. <laughs> and I thought, how, how the hell do I sing this? Who, who do I sing it like? Because Roger Daltrey as a singer wasn't really formed yet. Roger Daltrey could be James Brown or Johnny Cash or Alderson. You know, so it was very confusing to me. And then after, the, after Happy Jack came, I'm a boy. <laughs> wow. <laughs> How do I do this? You know, um, but I listen back to it now, and it's really quite extraordinary because, you know, the song is about a, a woman that wanted wanted uh, girls, and, and one of them turned out to be a boy, but she treated him like a girl. And obviously, I, I put myself in the position of what it must have been like for being a boy being treated like a girl, and I sing, I sang it with a voice. When I listen back to it, it's incredibly haunting. And it, it, it sounds like it, it's got a quality to it that is really, really kind of divorced from its body. It's, it's almost like you can hear the boy, you know, not wanting to be a girl, uh, uh, and, and singing, I'm a boy, I'm a boy, but it's kind of compressed and squashed and, it's frustrating. and lonely. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a strange quality and I'm very proud of it now. But at the time I was, I, I thought, oh, I'm not quite getting to grips with this. But it's a kind of, it must be a sort of form of acting in a way. I mean, did, did, he, did, did he sit down and tell you, right, this is a song about... No, he really told us anything. You didn't tell you anything? Is he now? <laughs> no, no, I never asked him. I don't need to know. I, it has to live in my head. And I have to internalise the words and feel what the song means to me. And I have to study those words and, and, and what those words are saying to me, because that's how it, it touches me. And then I have to make that try and touch you. And when I sing, I sing to you. I don't, I don't, when people say, you know, what's it like to sing to half a million people? So it isn't any different than seeing to one, because I sing to you. I don't sing to you, I sing to you, and I want to touch you with, with the emotion and the empathy of the song. I want the song to move you, and that's what it's about to me. I felt that, uh, you, you may be disagreeing much, but I felt that your, the, the kind of unique voice came, maybe with I Can See the Miles. It felt that that was the beginning of the journey which then led to Tommy and Quadrophenia and everything else. That, that is true, but I can see for miles, you know, the, the period up from my generation until 
I can see for miles was the, the period that I was kind of sacked from the band, reintroduced to the band under the condition I wouldn't fight anymore. Um, and, and, and I went back under the condition that they wouldn't take drugs anymore before the show. I didn't care what they did after the show, but before the show, we go on straight because the music meant too much to me. I also knew how much I had to work to go and see Cliff Richard and the Shadows at the Jizzit Empire in 1960, early 1963, I think it was, maybe 1962. And how, how much those tickets cost to go, and, and how much hard I had to work to get that money to go and see them. And I realised that if you're an artist on this stage and people see money, you paid money to sit out there and watch you, you owe it to them to deliver, and you owe it to them to be in a condition to deliver. And the drugs in the field, they didn't make it better. They could have made it, might have made it feel better to whoever was taking them on the stage. But generally, from, from the, the audience's point of view, the, the plane went downhill. And you have to remember, as a singer, it's a strange place on the stage to occupy, because I stand, I can't stand, <coughs> Out there. <laughs> I'm not really good with these mics. <laughs> and, and the band are all back here, so you, I don't see them. But what I do is feel them. So I, I'm very aware of every little detail of what they're doing. And if one of them is on speed or on downwards, I feel it. And it can, I can feel that the, this engine's firing on if it's a, a you know, a V8, it's only firing on six cylinders sometimes. That's, that was when Moon was at it. Um, but there was a period there in the first European tour where they all three of them got really very heavy on amphetamine um, because it was our first European tour. And the plane got so bad, they were playing so fast, so loud, I couldn't get the words to the songs in. So I'm mean, asking, this is this is a waste of time, and I got kind of angry. I got really angry because I just thought these people paid to see us, and this is crap. So I stormed off stage while they were smashing the gear up with glee and, and flushed the stash of amphetamine, which we keep suitcase down the toilet. And um, Keith went crazy about attacking me with a tambourine. <laughs> and, and you laugh, Fisher, it sounds, it sounds like a tambourine, or how dangerous was that? But the two, it wasn't the flat, nice, soft, big skin side of the tambourine that he attacked me with. He attacked me with the tambourine sideways in his hand, slashing at me with the bells, which is a very dangerous I weapon. Him against you. It could have been very nasty. Needless to say, he didn't beat me. <laughs> <laughs> I should say at this, at this point, you are managed by these two remarkable, unusual characters, Kit Lambert and Chris Stone. What was the relationship with the band and, and those guys like? Well, the, the, the truth is that the, the, the Who would not have made it to where they are at all without the help of them. Kit Lambert and Chris Stanley. They were, they were the most creative managers anyone could wish for. And they came at the time when we were, we were, we were the bud ready to burst. And, and they were the plant too, that, that grew that, that plant into the, you know, to, to, the, to what it became. Um, they were incredible. They were two very different characters. Kit Lambert, obviously, was, Oxford educated, studied ancient Greek. Um, Chris Stamp was from Canning Town, uh, brother of Terence Stamp, the, the, the film star. Even better looking than Terence. Uh, and so they had this kind of poor blimey Joe on one side and this little kind of non coward, flamboyant, uncomfortably gay character on the other. But because Kit was the, the, the son of Constant Lambert, the composer, he, 
he always had the dream and the vision that the, that the three minute pop song, as much as he loved it, as much as we do, did, and I still do, I think it's incredibly valuable, he said, this music can do more. And it was him that encouraged Pete to start writing uh, the, the, the longer pieces of music, trying to still tell more narrative within a, within a musical framework. We did a mini opera, and then went on to do what became the one thing that really put the Who on the map, which was Tommy. And, and it, was, it was Kit Lambert that drove that. It was Kit Lambert that, that guided the story. Um, it, 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 it was very much a Who Tommy, and that includes Kit Lambert and Chris Stan, as well as the, 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 the other three members of the band and myself. It's also a big leap, of course, you know, you did have the Who Sell Out, but then Tommy is such a different thing, you know, it hadn't really been done before on that scale. So what were your impressions of Tommy when you first, you know, when you first heard the demos or, you know? Well, the demos came in different, you know, we, it started with one song, it started with an amazing journey. And we had this idea of, of what life would be like just to experience through vibration, because music is vibration. And it's, it's all this musical link all the time. Um, what would it be like just to experience life through vibration? And if you were deaf, dumb, and blind, that's kind of all that would be happening to you, with your senses. And um, I thought, that, that, this is really interesting. But it was just that one song, and every, every night they would hear the kid that chat and chat and chat. And he'd come back the next day with a very rough demo of the song, and, you know, like Hassie King or whatever. And gradually the thing built itself, and then. He said to John, you know, I, I, want, I want this type of dark side. We need, you know, we, we need a cousin Kevin. We need a spiteful side of human nature. And we, we need, you know, the Uncle Ernie character. We need, we need that side. This is all about humanity. And then those, those kind of parts are all within us. It's just that they don't come out in us. It's all potentially there, which is scary, but it is true. Um, and so he got John to my Uncle Ernie and Cousin Kevin, and then Keith, with his very black humour, um, said, well, what they should do at the end is all go to a holiday camp, which is, which is basically like, a, you know, uh, uh, um, we come to the end because they all, they all rebel. Um, and we thought, oh, that's a good idea. So uh, the, the holiday camp sequence, which is, you know, Attributed to Keith Moon, it was his idea, although the people at the music. I'm just going to jump, I know it's a few years forward, but I've got to ask you about Tommy the film because it's still one of the most remarkable films. It's, there's nothing like it. Nothing, you know, Ken Russell was <laughs> absolutely unusual character. He, he, I believe he broke your back, amongst many other things. Maybe go, go. So just tell me about that. I mean, you know, he pushed you so far, didn't he? No, I don't think he did. I mean, the, the, you see, Ken was so loved, and he was such a cuddly, warm character. And he was, the wonderful thing about that whole period of time is that the artists were in charge of the creation. It wasn't like, it wasn't the accountant. <laughs> it was the artists. And Ken was one of those flamboyant geniuses who, who just, wanted to try things. And if you were working for him and had the privilege to do that, you'd, you'd die for him. And yes, he did have me. When I look back on me, I think I must have been mad. I must have been mad. I mean, it, it, like that, the hang gliding in those days, was, it was perhaps the first sort of four years of hang gliding ever, where hang gliders, instead of laying down like they do today, all nice and streamlined, you're sitting up on a little wooden swing, hanging from this piece of plastic, hoping that it goes up. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, but you do it for Ken because he was just so, he just had a quality about him that he was so enthusiastic and everything will be alright. And of course everything in the end was alright, a 
apart from what I might have broken in the back, but apart from that, it was a regret on that minor detail. <laughs> yes, a minor detail. But I mean, I look at it now and I, I, I think of, of that welcome scene in it, the song Welcome. And we were filming in, in, in a house on Canby Island, I don't think Canby, not Canby Island, Ailing Island. And, and it was a, just a detached house, quite posh, and it had a swimming pool in the back. And he's looking, he's scratching his beard, and he's looking at the house and going, I, this is the house, Roger, where we're going to do welcome, this is the outside of it. What do you think we can do to make it, you know, quirky? He said, um, and he's looking at the house, scratching his beard, and he said, do you think you could get up to the chimney? <laughs> <laughs> and I looked at the chimney, it's a two-story house with, you know, pitch roof. Yeah, why not, Kate? And I mean, and the next thing I know, I've gone up the drain pipe, climbed up the roof, and I'm hanging on the chimney. And the whole front part of that film is me singing, hanging on to the chimney in the sound. I didn't give it any more thought than that at the time, but now I look back, I must have been mad. It's <laughs> <laughs> back to the website, isn't it? Yeah. So here you go. I'm bomb, I'm bomb proof. Yeah. Just to go back uh, to. So one of these projects which didn't happen, but in a way did, in the sense that it became something else, is Life House. It's a really strange idea, and it seemed like it was such a kind of wide idea for Pete to get a handle on. Did you find that, Pete, that sometimes, you know, these ideas were too unformed, they're too, you know, too crazy? The, the problem with, with Life House, uh, as it was presented to us, is that Pete wrote, wrote the whole scenario of it with the idea of making a film. And Pete is just not a, 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 a filmmaker. And the idea of it, I thought, was very interesting, that if we ever find the real source of what life is, you know, when you go down across the atoms, you know, smaller and smaller, nano, 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 you'll find a musical note. But that kind of intrigued me, and I love that. That's really, but how do you make a film of that? And that was the problem. It wasn't. It was stuck in it. Pete trying to make this film, write, writing a script that kind of didn't make any sense at all. Um, I don't know whether he's published it, but it, it was extraordinary. None of us could get our brain around it. But equally, he then presented the music that became of his next. And I mean, that was fabulous. I mean, to hear that for the first time, it was like, wow, this is so special. That was almost the birth of, almost like the birth of Stadium Rock. You know, those songs suddenly had this, this epic quality which hadn't really existed before. No, that's right. I mean, he, he really jumped the wire on that one. He really did. And, and, and the great thing about that record is we had the demos possibly for about six or seven weeks before we ever recorded them. And that's the first time, that's, and only time that's ever happened to us. Um, where by the time we got in the studio, we were comfortable with the music, and we kind of made it the bands, rather than mimicking a Pete Townsend demo. Uh, and and I, that's why I think that album stands up as being perhaps the best recorded album. I mean, I, I think Quadrophenia suffered. The only reason I had problems with Quadrophenia ever in, in its original form was that we recorded it while we were, le we were learning it. Um, we were recording it in a studio that we just built, not knowing anything about building studios. It was, wasn't tuned uh, to true sound. So what we were hearing, or we thought we were, getting onto the tape wasn't actually there. And um, so that kind of, for me, Who's Next is the best one of the, the lot as far as record, recording quality. One of the themes, I guess, that I got from the book, especially when you get to Who's Next, when you get to that period, is that you've got something special, you've got something which has been successful now. And yet, all rock bands are volatile, but I think it's fair to say that the Who are unusually volatile. You know, when you've got Keith Mooney's who's rather blowing up toilet seats and toilets and just the sea and the rest of the hotel. <laughs> Hate you. <laughs> so my question is, 
did it always feel like it was on the edge of falling apart? And did you feel that it was your job to hold it together? Um, well, I was the only straight one with three addicts in the band, and, and someone had to keep it together. Um, but it never really felt like it was falling apart. No, it didn't. You know, um, there were times in the kind of early 70s, or mid 70s, between 1971 and 1976, where Keith did a few of his naughty drugs and, and passed out on stage, where we were, we were struggling a bit. I never thought it would, would, would end, but we were even, we were contractually obligated to do a certain amount of shows. And we did consider maybe we had to get another drummer in just to finish this tour and do something about Keith because he was taking stuff that was literally putting him out. Um, you know, a couple of shows there he collapsed on stage. And one show he did with a needle sticking out of his foot and got bumping full of adrenaline, keeping him awake. I mean, it wasn't funny anymore. Uh, and, but I never thought it would fall apart, no, never. And, you know, I mean, the great, the first great tragedy was, of course, Keith's death. You talk in the book about how you'd expected it, but in a way, that made it even more surprising because you'd been waiting, it for, waiting for it for four or five years. It made it, made it more traumatic um, because he'd had so many scrapes. And Keith, Keith Moon was fearless, he really was fearless. Uh, uh, and there were so many times, in, in, probably in the previous four or five years, that he could have gone, uh, but he didn't. So when it did actually come, and I picked up that phone, and I still remember it like it was yesterday. I was in the kitchen at home, and I picked up the phone, and, and Pete said, He's gone and done it. And I'm, who? What? He said, Keith. He's killed him. He's, gone, he's, he's died. He's dead. And it was. It hit like a hammer. Were there many conversations between you and John and Pete about, about Keith and about how to, where to carry on? Well, of course we did. We, we, we met. I can't remember when we did meet. I just went out for a very, very long run and just kind of psyched myself up to try and get through this pain. It was horrible. I ran around the farm twice, I think, that day. I was, oh, uh, it was, it was, I, I, it was one, I felt totally helpless that day. Um, I can't remember, it seems a blur the first week after that. Now, I can't remember where we first met, but I know that Pete and I talked. Um, John really didn't used to say much in any meeting. He wasn't, he was the quiet one. Uh, but we discussed what we had left, and I said to him, you know, what we have that's most important of all to me, and, and I suppose I had, you know, an axe to grind because it, 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 isn't, it was my life much more than it probably ever would, would have been key, uh, for Pete or John's. Um, I, I, we have the music, and the music for me was all important. And that followed the same when John got in, I said to Pete, we've still got the music, and if we play the music, it kind of brings them back alive. When who play today, Keith and John aren't with us, but they're there in the music, and they always will be. And the, the noise that they made in their lifetime is still echoing in that music. Yeah, it is and, that's kind of, and that's kind of wonderful. I like that. Yeah, it's a lovely thing. I mean, with John, he was it was the beginning of a tour, wasn't it? John was the day before the tour. Right. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah. Um, but I wasn't the shock with John because he'd been ill for a long time. Uh, he had heart problems, and no one was going to. They didn't call John the Ox for nothing. He was a stubborn, a stubborn company. And he had a lifestyle that was the way he wanted to live his life, and you could you could talk till the cows come home to him about changing his lifestyle to help himself out. It, it would just go in this year and out of that year. 
John was completely unconditional. He was going to go this way. He was the quintessential rock star, and he he died that way. And like like I say in the book, if if they had left him in the bed that he died in at the Hard Rock, put a case around it, made it an exhibit, he would have been as happy as that. <laughs> He'd be on it. No, he wouldn't. I mean, that was John Elms. He would have thought, this is a triumph. <laughs> a what? Yeah. Just going back a bit. There, there was a break in the, in the 1980s. And I want to ask, I mean, that came after a pretty traumatic time with the band, at least. When, the, when that was split, or, well, I don't know, you, you see it split at the time, certainly a break. Did it feel like a relief, or was it a break? Did it feel like you know, a break? Um, but it happened because we made the mistake of trying to replace the groove and did Kenny Jones, who's a great drummer, a great drummer for the small pack faces, was not the right drummer for the Who. And the only way, it, it, it just all started to go along. We needed a break. We didn't, we, we, we tried to, to, what we should have done was left the door open, you know. If we'd have been, when you take a wall out of a building, you know, you've got a three-sided room. The room can be any any size you want, and you can replace that missing wall with whatever you want. We kind of locked ourselves into something that didn't work, and the only way to get out of it was to break it. And we had that long break till 1989. I didn't mind. I, I, I never ever thought thought it was over. Um, I had my acting career, my, as I call my little acting career, because I didn't want the big acting career. I, 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 I had that taste of Hollywood with, with Tommy. I got nominated for a Golden Globe. I had all that stuff. I, I was out of my depth, um, and I didn't like it. It kind of felt funny to me. Um, too many smiling faces. <laughs> Happy to see you. Oh yeah. <laughs> Leave the other members of the hotel. Too brutal. <laughs> so, I after that break, how about getting back to it? What, what did you, you know? Did, 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 was everyone revived and feeling that it was a new well, stage? Well, by the time we came, came to 1989, Pete wanted to do it again, and, and, and for some reason or, or the other, he was kind of he was moaning about his hearing because. He, he does have trouble with his hearing, as do we all at our age and in the job we've done. Um, but he wanted to do it again, and, and I just gave him his reign. I just said, you know, sure, let's do it. Let's have a celebration tour. Uh, was it was it after was it 25 years or I can't remember what, what event it was. It was a celebration of some sort, um, and I just gave him his reign. And he, he wanted to be a band leader. Uh, uh, which was quite obvious from his face-to-face um, uh, -face record that he'd done. It's quite obvious that Pete, you know, Pete's dad was in a big band, and Pete had this thing about big bands, and he wanted to be a big band leader. So I thought I'd let him have his reign and put whatever band he wanted to get together to call them to go out and play our music. And that was the 1989 tour of America, and we did England as well, didn't do any of Europe. Um, and it was all right, the tour was okay. We had Simon Phillips on drums, which was a real step up from Kenny, because he, he loves a bit jazzy. He, he kind of put the rhythms right. Um, we had brass, we had backing singers. I called it the Bahama Rimba Band. But, uh, but, it, but it went down well, and it got us back together. And then nothing, <laughs> nothing again for another. Literally nothing again until that was 1989. There was nothing again until 1990. Ten years. It's a long time. Yes, a long, long time. But then when it came back together again after that ten years, I'd found Zach Starkey. And finding Zach Starkey was, was a, 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 you know, just a piece of luck. Um, because the, the history of Zach, he was, you know, Keith Moon babysat Zach. Keith was poor, poor thing, he survived that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this guy survived. Well, he's a babysitter, he can survive anything. He can survive the who. And, uh, and uh, he, 
just, he, I, I was just saying in the book, finding Zach was like finding a di diamond in a barrel of sawdust. He was so special. And he totally gets out of the movement. And he, he made it work. And when we reformed again in 1999, we reformed for a charity show. We were, Neil Young called us up and, and asked us to do his rich school charity that he, he did in San Francisco every year. It was for a, a, a school for um, handicapped children. And um, so we said, yeah, we'll do it. It's two, two days for him. And that got us back together. And uh, Zach came along and we did a couple of other shows to pay all the expenses of getting out there so that we didn't have to.